right, so we're back into our series on healing. And within that series, we've been, tacking, uh, we've been tackling deliverance. Three weeks ago, we looked in, at the history of deliverance in the church and the theology of deliverance. Then two weeks ago, we tackled the question of whether or not a Christian can have a demon. And I talked to you within that message about the nuance of language and what it is we exactly mean by a Christian being demonized. And I had my cheesy little graphic up here that I showed you. Let's show that again. That shows a person with unsurrendered territory. Okay? They might be a Christian. They might profess belief in Christ. But as we all do, there are still areas in our life that are not completely given over to the Lord. Who's still got areas in their life not completely given over to the Lord? Boy, that was, that was a trick. What, but way to go. Thank you for being honest. Hallelujah. <laughs> No, we all do, right? And so whenever we have that unsurrendered territory on the inside, that gives the enemy a place from which he can operate or even attack us from. Because every square inch in the known universe is either under the control of the Lord or under the control of the adversary, right? I know Switzerland's out there. You on one side or the other, period. Okay. We like to fool ourselves and pretend we're neutral, but we're not neutral. So I also made the argument a couple weeks ago that deliverance is only for believers and that according to Scripture, it would be very unwise without the specific leading of the Lord to practice deliverance on an unbeliever. We didn't get any questions on Menti or I didn't receive any questions in person, so I assume that everybody was able to absorb all of that without much trouble. Uh, there is the QR code. If you have questions on healing or deliverance you'd like me to answer, then uh, you can go to that website and submit your questions. So today I want to look at the possible sources of demonization because the adversary is at work in everything. He's at work in everything. There's the obvious things we know about, the blatant things we see in here, where there's no doubt that there is demonic influence or origin, but there's a whole lot of other things that we don't know about, right? And because the enemy ha is a snake, he has a snake-like character, that means he sneaks into things that we would never suspect that make us vulnerable to demonic oppression. And so this is about equipping you to minister deliverance to people, and sometimes when we're ministering deliverance to people, we have to hunt and peck to find out just what that door is that is allowing dark influence, right? Because primarily the way that we become demonized is we open the door. Yeah? We participate in things. We take things in. We think it's innocent, but we open the door. And if there's an open door, remember what the Lord said to Cain? The adversary is... Sitting at your door. Don't crack the door, Cain. What Cain do? He, he cracked the door. Okay? So we got to remember that. Sometimes when we're dealing with people, we're not going to be able to uncover it by asking them questions, and we'll need to ask the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, that prompts people to say, why would you bother to hunt and peck at all? Why wouldn't you just ask the Holy Spirit from the jump every time? There's certainly no prohibition against doing that. But the Lord has also given you a brain. Yeah? And so if we ask him for the answer every time, then we're going to brain dump that answer after the situation is over, right? It's like taking a test in school. If you go to school and take a test and you ask the professor all the questions and they always give you the answers, how much are you going to learn? Zip. You're going to brain dump it the minute you leave class because you've passed the test. And so sometimes we have to go through the process so that we're learning, so that we're better equipped. That makes sense to everybody? The other reason is sometimes, a lot of times actually, the Lord deals with things in layers. Did you know you were an onion? Some of you are cake. You know, like Donkey said, cake has layers too. But most of us are onions. And the Lord deals with us in layers. So he doesn't always reveal what the root issue is. Sometimes he's got to strip away a few layers first. 
and then you get a little season of reprieve and you get to grow a little bit more and then he comes back and says, wait a minute, there's some more layers and that process continues until you're dead. Yes, congratulations, until you're dead. That's how it goes. So he's not always going to reveal everything immediately because people can make quite a tangled mess of themselves, can't they? Now, can the Lord do that if he wants to? Can he cut right to the chase? Sure he can. He can do anything he wants. But most often he does things incrementally. Because I have to tell you, healing can be traumatic. Healing can be very traumatic. Okay? Related to this issue, I want to touch on the issue of abuse briefly. Because this is, a lot of, this is a lot of where people can pick up demonic attachments and not know it. Okay? So abuse in any form can impact our brain function. Of course, if it's physical abuse or violence, you can sustain a physical injury to your brain that causes permanent or long-term impairment. But what I'm speaking to is more of the psychological effects on your brain by abuse. Now, disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a mental health counselor or professional, but I've learned a lot in talking to those kind of people over the years and in, in a 30-year career of dealing with human beings and their behavior, amen? Yeah. When we as humans suffer abuse, it's of course traumatizing to different degrees depending on what the abuse is and God has designed our bodies our minds to protect ourselves from those events you've probably heard this before but generally speaking there are four common responses to trauma some would argue as many as six the goal of each of these responses is to restore our personal sense of safety right we were designed by God to feel safe. Yes? Okay. People naturally want to feel safe. And a lack of feeling safe will motivate people in one direction or another. You can't give someone counsel or advice if they don't feel safe with you. They will not listen to what you have to say. There are some people who feel safe all the time. There are other people who never feel safe, and there's everybody else that falls in between one of those two extremes, right? So does anyone know what the responses to trauma are? What's one? What's the first one? Fight. Let's look at it. There's the fight response, right? Fight response is to fight, yell, or control. The thought process being, if I establish power over the threat, I will feel safe. I will feel like I'm in control. Essentially, it's a perspective of I can protect myself through conflict. People who show a fight response, tense up, clench their jaw, ball their fist, they get angry, those kind of things, right? What's another one? Flight. Flight response is to run. Just, I got to get out of here. The thought process being, if I can run away, I will feel safe. It's a perspective of I can protect myself through escape. That might be literal, natural escape. It might be to escape psychologically. This is why people use narcotics, alcohol, pleasure, keeping themselves busy, all those kind of things to provide a way of escape. People who show a flight response are often restless and anxious and fidgety. They feel trapped. Their eyes are looking around because they're looking for the way to escape from the situation they're in. What's another one? Freeze. Freeze. Are they cheating? They put an answer up there before I get to it. <laughs> the freeze response is I space out in a situation. The thought process being, if I don't do anything, if I just freeze, I won't get hurt. I'll be safe. It's a perspective of I can protect myself through disassociating with what is happening to me. If I don't think about it or I don't focus on it, it's not really taking place. People who show a freeze response go stiff. They feel stuck. They hold their breath. 
They feel this tremendous sense of dread. What's another one? Fawn. The fawn response is when I try and protect myself from the threat by placation. So I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to run, I'm not going to freeze, but I'm going to try and placate and please the person I'm having the conflict with. The thought process being, if I appease you, then I will be safe. These kind of people find it difficult to say no. They have trouble really expressing how they feel. Sometimes they're afraid to express it based on what others might think or how others might react. And they can be so accommodating of others that they neglect themselves, allowing abuse to take place instead of sticking up for themselves. There's a few other responses that people advocate for, which are fine and faint. The fine response is to downplay trauma or abuse. It was fine. It was no big deal. That didn't really bother me. The thought process being if I tell myself or convince myself it was no big deal, then I will be safe. I can handle the situation without acknowledging that I've been abused or traumatized and I can convince myself that I'm okay. And then faint is just how it sounds. When I'm traumatized, I lose consciousness and pass out. Okay? So those are typical survival responses to trauma. When we encounter trauma, our bodies involuntarily go into survival mode. We experience all kinds of psychological and biochemical changes that are designed to protect ourselves, right? For example, hormones like adrenaline are released. Our pupils dilate, which let us take in more light, which help us to see the situation that we're in. Our breathing increases to increase our oxygen. Why? So we can fuel our muscles in case we have to escape. Glucose gets released from the liver and gives you an energy boost, okay? So all of those things are happening because God has designed us to survive and to thrive. Amen? One of the things that can happen to our brain is the brain can disassociate or partition parts of itself off. So let's take a look at this first picture, please. Okay, this plate is a person's brain. It's undamaged. It's clean. This is their psyche before they experience any abuse or trauma. Next slide, please. This hammer is trauma or abuse. Okay? When trauma hits your, blank, uh, your brain, this happens. Yes, Jessica. Correct. Trauma happens and your brain has now fractured involuntarily. Now, if a person is traumatized over and over again, this can lead to a pattern of disassociation. Next slide. And so if left untreated, then as a person gets older, their personality continues to fragment and they can end up having severe mental health disorders. The most extreme being multiple personality disorder, right? Each one of those little pieces ends up becoming a personality all on its own that they take on. So we need to understand that this uh, disassociation, this self-preservation is a mechanism of our natural minds. That doesn't make someone demonic because this happens to them, right? But what you need to understand is that the demonic can come and attach themselves to these pieces of disassociation. If we're a victim of abuse, we may not even understand that our brain goes through this. But it does because that's what the brain has been designed to do. It's why people can't sometimes remember trauma that's happened to them. It's why people stuff things down in their life. They can seemingly live for decades and decades, and then all of a sudden in their 50s, their life falls apart because this thing that's been down in there that's been not dealt with comes to life. Amen? Comes out like a jack-in-the-box. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Right? 
And then all of a sudden you're 53 and and everybody goes, what happened to him? Okay. It's also why so many people are just out there functioning instead of living. You know there's a difference? A lot of people are out there just functioning. Okay. They're functioning because they're just surviving, not because they're healthy. Okay. Thank God Jesus said he came to give us life and life more abundantly. So, you know, the adversary, I've said this before, is merciless. So he comes along and he attaches to these parts of disassociation and through the trauma that's there, he continues to abuse the people that have those issues. And so when we come along as deliverance ministers, we can assist in removing the demon but that doesn't heal the disassociation. And so that's why uh, us, for example, at APC, we would advocate for both the inner healing and deliverance process and professional counseling because these kind of things are recoverable. Uh, and I don't think oftentimes that just one or the other is appropriate. You have different services because they have different roles in that capacity. Everybody understand that? Okay. Let's go back to deliverance. When dealing with deliverance issues or evil issues in general, there's two mindsets that I want you to be on guard against. Mindset number one is that everything is demonic. No, it's not. Some things are bad. Some things are the result of bad choices. Some things can even be wrong or evil. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're demonic. Please do not become a Christian that walks down the street and believes that there's a demon hiding behind every bush, okay? Or that any time anything bad happens to you, it's the devil. You know, sometimes you get a flat tire because you drive over a nail. Other times you get a flat tire because it's the devil. But, you know, you just have to use discernment because this is a fallen world and there are bad circumstances in it and sometimes we just fall victim to those bad circumstances right so you got to practice wisdom and discernment mindset number two is that nothing is demonic that's not true either the reality is there are forces at, uh, of darkness at work in the earth there's volumes of evidence for that those forces of darkness have an appointment with the judge of all creation, same as you do, right? And they, until they reach that day, they get to do what they've been doing for thousands of years. So the bad news is they're in the fight until the end. The good news is so are you, right? Amen. And Everything that you need to get rid of them is found in you if you know the Lord. Yeah? Okay. And apparently, even if you don't know the Lord, because there's going to be people that tell the Lord on the last day, but Lord, I dealt with these demons in your name. And he's going to say, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. So apparently, even if you know him or don't know him, you have the ability to deal with these things. That makes sense? So we can't afford to have either one of these mindsets. And in order to know the difference in the negative situations we encounter, we have to operate in wisdom and discernment. We need to understand what the Bible says. Okay? I, I'll give you an example. Last Friday, before I taught at the conference, uh, the gathering, I was on my way home from, we had a three hour break in the afternoon session and I was gonna speak Friday night. So I'm driving home and as I'm driving home, I get this sharp shooting pain that goes through my body. It starts at my waist and it goes right up into my chest like this. It's a pain I've never felt before. It was a 10 on a scale of one to 10. I grabbed myself, I said, ah, ugh, what was that? Right? And I heard immediately that was an attack. And I thought, well, that's silly. But I said, man, I got to tell you, if you ever got gutted by a sword, I can imagine that's what it would feel like. Now, I didn't feel nothing else. Went home, 
took me a little nap, come home, spoke that night. Saturday, didn't feel nothing. Sunday, three times in the afternoon and evening, I felt the same kind of pain, half as severe, and only this time, shorter. Very fast, like lightning. And then I became tender down here on the right side of my abdomen. So I thought, shoot, is my appendix going bad? Then Monday, same thing, two more times, um, half as severe, not as bad, but still, just a pain like I've never felt pain before in my life. So I said, well, I'm fat and unhealthy, so what I should do is go to the doctor. You can laugh, I said. So Tuesday, I went to the doctor, and I... So I went in there, and they said, okay, what's going on? So I described what happened to the nurse practitioner, and she looked at me, and she said, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard anybody say in my life. <laughs> and, and I knew, I knew walking in the door to the doctor, I said, man, this was an attack. This was not natural. I just knew. And so I told her about it. She said, yeah, I've never heard anything like that before, but let's do all the tests. So they did all the tests, you know, they did a urine test, they did a blood test, they took x-rays, they looked at everything. She came back, she said, you're completely normal, there's nothing wrong with you. I said, yeah, I know it. <laughs> and she said, uh, you know, we, we can do a CT scan, I'm willing to do a CT scan on your abdomen if you feel that's necessary. Because she said, I want you to feel comfortable. And I said, nah, that's not going to be necessary, it's going to be all right. And so... Paid my tab and went on about my way, right? So that's an example of not everything is demonic. Sometimes it is. You got to have the discernment to know the difference. I followed the natural course because I'm a natural kind of guy. But at the same time, I was holding intention that that thing could also have been a spiritual attack like what I heard. And apparently it was. And I've been fine and I ain't had no issues since. Praise the Lord. Thank you for protecting me. So... When we're dealing with others, we want to ask probing questions that help us determine what's going on. But here's one thing I want to say to you. You always got to remember that the person you're dealing with is the priority. The person you're dealing with is the priority. The person you're dealing with is the priority. In other words, deliverance is a ministry of love. That love is demonstrated by how the person we're ministering to is treated. I know deliverance ministers who at all costs will go after a demon and more or less force deliverance on a person because they're not thinking about the needs of the person they're more interested in driving away the spirit like they're some spiritual Rambo. That's not love. Jesus saw people who were demonized. He didn't deliver them all. He delivered the ones that came to him and said, Lord, help me, I need to be free. When you go after a demon over the person's consent, that's making the demon the priority and not the person. And when that happens, the person can be wounded or scarred by the process of deliverance, and they should not be. You can be successful as a deliverance minister, and because of your authority in Christ, drive away demons. It's labor-intensive, it's exhausting, it's not honoring the person. It's not the best way to do it, but it can be done. But I don't recommend that process at all. The other way to minister deliverance is to gain their cooperation, be their coach, and coach them into deliverance by allowing them to work with the Holy Spirit themselves to be free. When you do that, you don't have to fight demons. You won't have exhausting sessions that drag on for nine hours and things like that. It's way less sexy. Those kind of deliverance reels won't generate views on TikTok, which is why people don't want to do it that way. But it is honoring, and it does prioritize the person over the demon. 
Unfortunately, too many deliverance ministers out there would rather get glory for themselves by making a big production out of it. The other reason I prefer the coaching method is because sometimes people don't want to get rid of their demons. I always, always ask people if they want to be free. Because you do this long enough, you will encounter people who tell you no. They don't want to be free. For whatever twisted reason, when they discover they have resident friends, they prefer to keep them. And all of that shows you is how deep their deception is. Sometimes that's fear-based. I know we don't understand it, but sometimes a person can be oppressed for so long, they don't even remember what life is like without their friends. Okay? So based out of fear of the unknown, they prefer the status quo, even if that means they get to be tormented a little bit. I can't explain it to you. Everyone with a rational mind says, well, I would never want that. Well, thank the Lord you've not been demonized to that point. In other cases, they may say they want to get rid of their demons with their mouths, but in their heart, they really don't. So as a deliverance minister, you can end up in a tug of war with people and their will. Not the demon, but their will. Because they don't want them to leave, and so they empower the demon to stay because they're not cooperating with the Lord, despite what they say with their mouths. Okay? So the coaching method is really important. All right, let's talk about some obvious ways people can experience demonization with or without knowing it. Are you ready? You excited? Yeah. Kind of? Not really? <coughs> All right, the first is curses. People may or may not believe in this, but I have to tell you, they really are a thing. What is a curse? By definition, a curse is an evil appeal to harm, for harm to come to someone. This can happen intentionally or unintentionally. There are accidental curses and there are purposeful curses. Accidental curses are one of the reasons we have to be very careful about the things that we say and how we say it, right? The enemy is a legalist. He is trying to operate within legalities to take territory and stake out claims. So even when we don't mean to, we can give him a license to operate by what we say. When we speak words of criticism or condemnation to or about someone, the enemy can partner with those words and bring them under the power of a curse. And then the demonic then have a legal right to partner with those words. That's why you got to be really careful when you get angry about the things you say, right? Because you can blurt something out and then that sets something very dangerous in motion and there's things happening on a supernatural level. As an example, being a parent, right? Being a parent is never frustrating, right? <laughs> and somehow I get angry and they'll say to one of their children, man, you're never going to amount to anything. And he loves to partner with a word like that, okay? That's all the statement it takes to empower the adversary, okay? That child grows up, they never find success in anything they do, the world would call it somebody who's plagued by bad luck, okay? So you have to be careful about statements like that. If you say them in frustration, be purposeful about renouncing them. If you've said them in the past or you're worried that you might have said them in the past, pray and ask the Lord. Lord, have I ever said anything dumb? Believe me, the Lord will bring to your remembrance things if you've said dumb things. He's done it to me. You said this. And I'm like, man, I don't remember even saying that. He's like, trust me, you said it. I need you to take it back. And so you can ask for forgiveness and renounce those things and break any curses that you have spoken, even if they're accidental. Purposeful curses, on the other hand, have been done intentionally. They are spoken with the intent of bringing harm. There are people who practice witchcraft or operate in the occult, and they use curses to do so. There are people in the world who are paid to do this as part of their vocation, right? Oftentimes, they use rituals to invoke curses. Sometimes those rituals involve blood oaths or pacts. 
Sometimes it's their blood. Sometimes it's the blood of animals. Sometimes it's the blood of humans. And if they can, particularly the blood of babies. And I'm not talking about in third world countries. When it's a situation involving the family line, we call those generational curses. So you can become the victim of a curse through no fault of your own, through someone unintentionally cursing you, intentionally cursing you, or through something that was spoken over your family line generations before you. The important point is that you're aware how to recognize generational curses and fend them off. Here's some common signs of a curse. Mental or emotional breakdown. Repeated or chronic sicknesses, especially if they're hereditary and they go back several generations. Barrenness, repeated miscarriages, or other related issues like that can be signs of a curse. Breakdown of the family, marriage, and alienation issues. Sometimes you have those families where there's just been divorce after divorce after divorce after divorce going back generations. That can be the result of a curse. Continuing financial insufficiency. I'm not talking about you loving Amazon too much. I'm talking about no matter what you do, you cannot get ahead financially because you're under a curse. Being accident prone. We had a child that on a clean linoleum floor could trip and hit the ground every time she walked through the kitchen, okay? Being accident prone, always having accidents, always injuring yourself, always having things like that happen to you can be a sign of a, per of a curse. Also, history of suicides or unnatural or untimely deaths. Um, I had a guy tell me, you know, every male in my family line going back four generations died before the age of 40. You know, those kind of things, you got to pay attention to some of those signs. So if we want to be free of curses, all you got to do is break them. It's as simple as saying to the Lord, I want to be free of any curses that have been spoken over my life. You don't even have to have specific knowledge about them in order to be free. If I've got a family history of untimely deaths or deaths by accident, I simply say to the Lord, hey, I want to be free of that. I don't want that thing to affect me. If that curse is on my family line, please break it off. Okay? Next area we're going to cover are inner vows. Inner vows are things that we often say about ourselves. Most of the time, you're not intending to harm yourself. Most of the time, you don't even remember what you said, but you say something out of hurt or frustration, and in an attempt to protect yourself, make yourself feel safe, you actually harm yourself, and you don't even know it. One of the most common examples I can give you is in relationships. People get hurt in a relationship, and they say something like, I'll never let anyone get close to me like that again. That can put up a wall between you and the Lord, and you and other people. And because you won't ever let anyone get close to you, you've, you've created that spiritual dynamic. You may not even remember it. You may go on to the next person and really love them and really want to be in relationship with them, but you don't know that you've created that spiritual barrier there to prevent intimacy. And so that thing continues. It becomes a destructive force in your life in relationships. And then the adversary loves to partner with those kind of things. So you got to renounce those kind of things that you say and let the Lord remove them from your life. Okay? The other way inner vows can affect us, which probably, hopefully, most likely is not applicable to people in this room, but occultic activity often involves inner vows often participating in cult-like activities or practices involve making vows or pacts. Um, I knew a guy one time that was severely demonically oppressed. He had taken several vows about things he would never say. And of course, the enemy had made him make these vows because they're things he needed to say and confess to the Lord, right? It's the confession of our mouth, right? How many things do we receive by confession of our mouth? So how brilliant of the enemy to get this guy convinced that he needed to not say these things and that they were, should be closely held secrets and all this kind of stuff. That's dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. 
So if I take those kind of vows, I give the adversary unfettered access to my life to torment and steal and kill and destroy. So here again, you have to renounce those things, ask forgiveness for the Lord from them so he can clear them up. The next thing is going to be soul ties. Soul ties are a form of bondage. They come about when people enter into covenant relationship with another person in an ungodly way. Sexual relationship outside of marriage is an example. You can establish a tie with a man or a woman at the soulish level. We're designed to become one flesh in the context of marriage, yes? So whenever people are doing that outside of the context of marriage, they're becoming one with a whole lot of people. It's kind of hard to become one with multiple people, right? And so in reality, they're fracturing themselves and giving pieces of themselves away and receiving pieces of multiple people from others. So part of our salvation and sanctification experience involves the restoration of our soul. We can deduce that the Lord does not want to see us in these unhealthy soulless relationships. So you got to ask forgiveness for that kind of thing. Ask the Lord to restore to you all the pieces that you've given away and to remove the pieces from you that you've allowed to be attached to yourself through committing sin. It's why some people can go on and have marital relationships, but then there's some person back in their past that still got a hook in them. Okay. The next few areas we're going to cover are more overtly demonic. We generally call those things the occult. If you study the word occult in the Greek, it means to keep secret, to conceal from. This should not surprise us as the enemy is most successful under the cover of darkness, figuratively speaking. To the Greek, things that were occultic were associated with practicing magic, spells, alchemy, astrology, divination, and necromancy. In the Hebrew, there's about eight different Hebrew words that we would translate as the word occult in English. They relate to making contact with spirits who are not God, trying to contact the dead, foretelling the future by casting lots, predicting the future through signs in nature, enchantments, casting spells, sorcery, and speaking curses over people. These kind of things are as old as time. In the big picture series, we talked about fallen beings who rebelled against God, then came to earth. They were involved in teaching these things to human beings, and the Lord took a very strong stance against them. This is what he said to the Israelites when the law was given so we can have an official message. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Those are eternal words of wisdom right there. And do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. So these same things continue right up until today, and they are still detestable to the Lord. The occult finds its success in being hidden and in being secret, so people are unknowingly caught in a trap and put in bondage. Being ignorant of the trap does not save you from the trap. In fact, that's how you get trapped, right? When hunters trap animals, the animal doesn't come along and go, oh, look, a trap, let me walk into it. No, they walk into it because they don't see it there, okay? Here are some of the ways occultic things have sneaked into our modern-day societies. First one is medicine. I'm not talking about Tylenol and Advil. 
I'm talking about things that are referred to as alternative medicines. For example, there are things called therapeutic touch and Reiki touch that are marketed and sold as alternative healing methods. There are at least five certified Reiki touch therapists in Lynchburg. Okay? Reiki touch has their roots in Hinduism and Buddhism. These therapies claim to heal people by channeling energy from the universe into the body. The claim being that since the energy is from the universe, the energy knows right where to go where you're afflicted. Yeah, I bet it does. <clears throat> At its core, it's spiritism. It's demonic. Reiki Touch has been so successful, there are health insurance programs that pay for you to get that as a form of therapy. When's health insurance going to start paying for people to come to church to get healed? Right? If they can do it, why can't we? The word Reiki is a Japanese word that means God's life force energy. And I ain't talking about God with a capital G, okay? Not Yahweh. So people go to these places for healing, and they might even get temporary relief in the moment. But next thing you know, they're worse off than they got started and they become quickly demonized because they're running into things that they're ignorant about and they get caught in the trap. Right along with that is New Age beliefs. New Age beliefs and practices suggest life and health can be prolonged and improved. And what they do is they take Eastern concepts that are based in Hinduism and Buddhism and animist beliefs they dress them up in Western terms to make them feel harmless. These are things such as acupuncture, biofeedback, reflexology, meditation, and even reincarnation therapies. These are masked as things that promote a concept of healing, again, through inner or cosmic energies, but they are not based in the power of God. I know Christian ministers in this city that practice those kind of things. And because people are so hungry for healing, they're willing to do just about anything. And so they ignorantly subject themselves to these alternative practices and unknowingly allow demonization and affliction into their lives. The next is Ouija, tarot cards, card games, movies, music, and video games. There's lots of things out there that seemingly involve innocent behavior using crafty marketing and the mask of fun, dark and sinister plots are unfolding everywhere that adults and children are participating in that are chock full of occultic influence. Children are the easiest targets because they lack discernment, they lack the ability to understand what's happening behind the scenes and they don't recognize the danger, so they're unable to defend themselves. And the adversary especially hates children. And as a result, he goes after them with impunity in the hopes that he can inflict as much damage on them as possible if he's given the chance. Sometimes they are overt and sometimes they're covert. Music, for example. Have y'all ever stopped and actually listened to the lyrics of worldly music? For real, okay? You'll be blown away by the content of what people are listening to. They are suggestive in the area of sex, violence, idolatry, heresy, and so many other things. But they got a catchy tune and an interesting beat. And people are blindly ingesting these things hour after hour after hour throughout their day. The number, song, the number one song right now out there in the world culture is about getting drunk at the bar to handle your problems. That's the number one song that's out there right now. The number two song right now is about a fractured relationship made worse by alcohol addiction. The number three song is about a woman who uses sex to manipulate a man. Those are the offerings the world has, and that's the number one, number two, and number three song in American culture right now today. 
Isn't that great? That's lovely, isn't it? And people are repeatedly ingesting that, and then they wonder why their lives are crap. You can't wash your hands in muddy water and come out with clean hands. And that's the problem. Too many people are messing with this stuff and they're expecting to come out clean. You're not going to come out clean. You're not going to come out clean. You play with slime, you're going to get slime on your hands. Even in innocence, my, mo my own mother gave a testimony in church a few years ago when she was a teenager at a, at a carnival or fair with a friend, went into the tent of a fortune teller to have her fortune read. Okay? When I spoke on this four or five years ago, she was delivered of a haunting spirit that she believed had followed her around for the last 50 years from that one experience. Yeah, it was fear, spirit of fear. From that one experience as a teenager, you step into a fortune teller's tent because it was cool. And back in them days, they only paid 10 cents to have your fortune read. Isn't that fun? What an exchange, have a spirit of fear for 50 years for 10 cents. So those are the kind of traps and snares that people are falling into every day. Next. Satanism. There are people who are willingly and intentionally getting involved in Satanism. Almost every school year, there are news stories about Satanists wanting to start after school clubs in elementary and junior high schools. But Satanism is also trying to market itself as freedom and liberty and putting yourself first. Okay? People who participate in those kind of things end up highly demonized. It's not uncommon for people to take blood oaths and vows, which become very complex and difficult to break. Oftentimes, the adversary goes to very great lengths to prevent them from renouncing those vows, even if that means killing them so they can't be set free. So you got to be careful of that. Along those lines, you have Freemasonry. Freemasonry and other secret societies like the Elks, the the Elks Lodge, the Moose Lodge, the Shriners, all of those things present themselves as good and worthy fraternal public service organizations. In reality, they have their basis in occultic worship and dark magic and secret oaths. Fortunately, hundreds and thousands of people have been set free from those things and have been able to give us insight into those organizations. Freemasonry goes back, has its origins in Europe, going all the way back to the 1600s, specifically in England and Scotland, where it's still very prevalent today. It's considered the world's oldest fraternal organization. It was condemned by the Catholic Church in 1738, with the Vatican referring to Masons as the synagogue of Satan. Worldwide membership is considered to be between five and six million people. Settlers to America brought Freemasonry with them, where many of America's founding fathers were Masons, such as George Washington. Masonic symbols and monuments are very prevalent throughout America. They're found in almost every major American city throughout the country. I went to a town one time that had one stoplight. You know what else it had? A huge Masonic lodge in it. One stoplight. Population was like 498. One of the biggest buildings in it was a Masonic temple. Masonic monuments and symbols are very prevalent. Let's see, let's look at some of the symbols up there. Freemasonry has a lot of Christian symbolism to it, but the roots of it are occultic worship and sexually deviant worship of idols. Let's go to the next side, slide. This is the most common Masonic symbol that you'll see, new adherents to Masonic beliefs are told that the G there stands for the great architect of the universe, who is the God that they serve. And your assignment when you become a Mason is to embark on a quest to discover the real name of God. Then they have a progress, they progress through a series of levels 
And when they reach their seventh level, the real name of God is revealed to them. Masons claim that this name is Jabulan. Jah is the shortened form for Yahweh or Jehovah, the God of Israel. Bull is another rendering of Baal. And on was the word that was used in the ancient times to call upon the god Osiris of Babylon. And so the Masons believe that this name of God is so sacred that it takes two or three of them together to even utter his name. Okay? <clears throat> As they progress through the levels of Freemasonry, they take oaths to this name and vows once a person joins a Masonic Lodge, they go through an initiation. This initiation is intended to strip a person of their God-given identity in exchange for an identity from Satan. Initiation involves being in a dark room, having a noose applied to your neck to symbolize that you're being hung. Isn't that nice? What if we did that when people joined the church? <laughs> We want you to kill your, your, your old self man, your, your flesh man. Let's put a noose around your neck to welcome you into the church. The point being of the noose that you're dying to yourself and surrendering your mind to Freemasonry. You're then stripped of all your clothing. We don't want to do that, do we? You're then stripped of all your clothing. Then you sign oaths, oftentimes in your own blood. Penalties for breaking your oath involve curses on yourself and your family line, dismemberment, and death. Isn't that nice? Such a loving society. I'm going to read you a section from one of Randy Clark's books on healing and deliverance because this is going to give you specific insights. You enjoying this? These are the people that are doing the parades that everybody goes to because they love seeing them guys in the funny hats driving little cars around. First degree initiates into Freemasonry begin by taking secret vows in the midst of pagan rituals that swear on the name of that God. As they progress through each seceding level, the oaths and rituals take on greater obscenity and violence. A first degree initiate called an entered apprentice swears to keep his vows and should he violate these oaths in any way, he agrees to have his throat cut from ear to ear and his tongue torn out by the roots and buried in the sand at low tide. Advancing to the second degree as a fellow craft, he swears to have his left breast torn open and his heart ripped out and given to the wild beasts of the field and the birds of the air if he violates his oath. A master mason at the third degree swears that if he should violate his oath, he will consent to have his body cut in half, his bowels ripped out and burnt, after which they'll be scattered to the wind. Part of the third degree initiation process involves having the initiate lie on the floor as if he's dead, so the worshipful master of the masons can raise him up to new life. There are several degrees beyond the third degree, but that's enough of an explanation to let you know the nature of their oaths and their resultant curses. Masons are not supposed to violate their oaths nor betray a fellow Mason except in cases of murder or treason. There was a woman named Barbara Casada who wrote a book on Freemasonry called Unto Death. And she points out that murder and treason were added to their, their oaths after the death of a Freemason named William Morgan in 1826. He left the Masons and was telling the secrets of the rituals that they do, and then he was subsequently murdered. She goes on to point out the horrific implications of this when we consider that many in leadership in law enforcement and our judicial system and at high levels of government are Freemasons. For example, if a judge is a Mason and he's sitting on a bench and the person in the trial is a Mason, he is supposed to disregard the law and find in favor of the Mason because he has sworn an oath to be more loyal to his brothers than upholding the law. The same is true for law enforcement officers, lawyers, politicians, regardless of nationality. Wherever Freemasonry exists, loyalty to a Freemason takes precedence over right and wrong. 
So in, in the 80s, Randy Clark was preaching on this in one of his conferences, and a man in the congregation began to feel sick to his stomach. He had been involved in Freemasonry, so he bought a copy of Cassandra's book and read it the next day. The more he read, the sicker he became as the Holy Spirit began to convict him of the truth of Freemasonry. So he began to renounce the oaths that he had taken as part of becoming a Freemason. And as he did, demons literally began to tear his insides out. He said it felt as though cats were clawing at his stomach and intestines. And he ran to the bathroom to vomit and relieve himself and there began profusely bleeding into the toilet. He battled throughout the day and the next day and with the help of his wife and his pastor was eventually fully delivered after hours of walking through renouncing his involvement in Freemasonry. He said, I realized that for all those years spent in opposition to God, he was there all the time watching out for me and loving me and longing for a relationship with me. And I know that God revealed his love to me that day, forgave me of my sin and set me free. The degrees of Freemasonry contain no spiritual truth to make it worthy of all the curses and secrecy they contain. Quite the contrary, the secrecy serves to confuse and deceive and hide the truth from anyone attempting to examine Freemasonry. The principles of Freemasonry are comprised of select portions of the Christian faith placed on a decidedly anti-Christian foundation. Because of the secret nature of Freemasonry and other similar secret societies, the web of deception is very difficult to recognize. And often when you encounter others who are suffering the consequences of curses through Freemasonry, it's because they've taken those oaths and they have some ancestral involvement in Freemasonry. We have some people in this church who've been set free of things because of their ancestors being involved in Freemasonry. And so you gotta walk people through renouncing those things so they can be set free from Satan's authority in their lives because of those oaths. It's not difficult to free people from those things if they're willing to walk through those renunciation, renunciation prayers and um, repent to the Lord, all right? So all these things I've discussed today are ways that people can intentionally or unintentionally find themselves demonized. So when we're ministering healing, we've got to keep in mind that there can be spiritual causation to people's illnesses and diseases and health problems, and there can also be natural causes. Again, not everything is demonic. We can't have the viewpoint that nothing is demonic, but we've got to be alert and aware and exercising wisdom and discernment so we can see the most people freed from darkness as possible. Amen? Amen. All right. That's it for today. Nice uplifting <laughs> message. The point is about keeping you aware, okay? Because the people are coming. The people are coming who are going to need deliverance and who are going to need healing. And we're going to be the ones that are doing it. And the Lord's told me we're, we're wrapping this thing up on healing and deliverance. The people are equipped. You've been made equipped. We spent probably the better part of three months going through healing. It's time to see it in action. Amen.